Hello and thank you very much indeed for joining this video. All are welcome. You are looking of course at a portrait of Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, who is the principal subject of all of the presentations on this channel. If you've been watching them you may be coming to the view that he is something of a split personality. Someone who on the one hand gets up to great mischief, who seems to surrogate an heir by putting together his young unmarried friend Henry, Earl of Southampton, with his mistress, the married lady Penelope Rich. He is one who is described by his contemporaries as a horrible, detestable blasphemer, monstrous adversary, drunken atheist, an addle head, and a railing tongue. You will also have noticed that he is someone who is very devout, someone who has followed uh, John Dee's recommendation to turn his name into number and to register it in the eternal trinity as double V and 1740. He is one who is described by his contemporaries as imbued with special piety and perfect integrity, as honestas pietas et magnanimus, and a devout and magnificent and very learned and religious nobleman, and so worthy in every way. These are the words of George Buck, who was in charge of putting on all the theatre performances at court, and absolutely accomplished with honourable endowments. So what I want to do today is try to get inside the mind of this extraordinary poet, patron and scholar and to try to reconcile for you these apparently opposing positions in particular relation to the surrogation of his heir, the 18th Earl of Oxford. We need to go back in history to 1575 when Edward de Vere was in Paris. He was written to by his father-in-law, Lord Burley, to give the good news that his wife, Anne, was pregnant with their first child, and Burley recommended that he return home immediately on account of that. Oxford wrote back to Burley, Your letters have made me a glad man. I thank God that it hath pleased him to make me a father, and if it be a boy I shall likewise be the partaker with you in a greater contentation. But thereby to take an occasion to return, I am far off from that opinion. For now it hath pleased God to give me a son of mine own, as I hope it is, methink I have the better occasion to travel. Sith whatsoever becometh of me, I leave behind me one to supply my duty and service, either to my prince or else my country. This short paragraph tells us a great deal about Edward de Vere, that he was a believer in God, a divine destiny, that he owed a duty of service to crown and country, and that his personal safety mattered less to him if he had a male heir, because that heir would ensure the continuity of duty and service to crown and country that is promised by the honour of his line. With this in mind, it becomes clear that he considered it a preeminent duty to provide a male heir for queen and country. In his first marriage to Anne Cecil, he succeeded in providing only one male heir, who died after just two days. This book, full of many egregious errors by a man called Alan H. Nelson, claims that he had more than one son by the Countess of Oxford. He translates this Latin plurium liberorum, which means many children, translates it quite wrongly, actually, as several sons, claiming this inscription provides the only evidence that Anne had given birth to more than one son. It's the only evidence because it isn't evidence because it's a bad translation. Uh, Alan H. Nelson is, isn't terribly good at Latin. He provides a whole chapter in this book saying that Edward de Vere was useless at Latin and gives about eight examples. I went through all of them and was able to show that Edward de Vere was correct. Alan Nelson was wrong. As I say, he's not very good at Latin. So only one son. This is Philippe Desport, the famous French poet, who provided consolation for the Countess of Oxford when her only son died. We know that because she wrote several poems, four epitaphs made by the Countess of Oxford after the death of her young son, Lord Bolbeck, and scholars have shown that these are based on poems by Philippe Desport. She writes, Destines and gods, you might rather have taken my twenty years than the two days of my son. Of course, Alan H. Nelson is, as I said, not, not great at Latin, not great at poetry either, because he gets this wrong, very literally saying, well, she was 26 years old, why write 20 years? Of course, you only have to look up the word 20 in the Oxford English Dictionary to find it is used vaguely or hyperbolically for a large number. Citing examples by the Countess of Oxford's husband, 
William Shakespeare and by her first cousin, Francis Bacon. So clearly the crowd around the Countess of Oxford used 20 to mean a large number. So she's writing, Destines and gods, you might rather have taken my many years than the two days of my son. I imagine that her son was born, we know he was born in Headingham, that the news was sent presumably down to London where the Earl of Oxford was resident, that he would have come up the very next morning to see his son and held him perhaps for no more than one hour before he died. I deduce this from Shakespeare's Sonnet 33, in which he writes, Even so, my son, one early morn did shine with all triumphant splendour on my brow, but out alack, he was but one hour mine, the region cloud hath masked him from me now. Very moving lines. Notice this important technique used often in the sonnets of taking one word, punning with it, and allowing that pun to work both ways uh, for a stretch, in this case of at least four lines, where the sun acts as both the celestial body but also as his child. We'll come to this technique again looking at Sonnet 17 presently. It's a very important to understand how Shakespeare uses this and why he uses it helps you to understand the sonnets much, much better. Now, the Countess of Oxford, a very literary woman, found her consolation in the death of her son by reading the poems of Philippe de Port. What then did her literary husband, Edward de Vere, what did he read for consolation? Well, I can take an educated guess about that and suggest this book called Cardanus Comfort, published in English by commandment of the Right Honourable Earl of Oxford. The Earl of Oxford absolutely loved this book and it contains quite a lot of advice and consolation and comfort for one who has no heir, whose only child has died, whose heir has died, etc. If we look in this book we see that the Earl of Oxford writes a letter in it and that he explains why this book should be published so many may reap knowledge by the reading of the same that shall comfort the afflicted confirm the doubtful and encourage the coward and lift up the base-minded man to achieve to any true sum or grade of virtue whereto ought only the noble thoughts of men to be inclined. We know that he had read this book in Latin before the age of 21 and clearly it was something that meant a lot to him in later years. If we look at the first quarto of Hamlet, for instance, the king says, see where he comes pouring upon a book, enter Hamlet. Hamlet thereupon goes into his famous to be or not to be speech. And from 1836, scholars have been saying that the to be or not to be speech is drawn very much from the book Cardanus Comfort. It is known even to Stratfordian scholars as Hamlet's book. And of course, it is the Earl of Oxford's book, but they don't like to put that two and two together necessarily. So what then did Cardanus say about someone who has no sons and about taking on someone else's son? He said, thy son is dead. If thy son be an infant and thine only son, why shouldst thou not then make another man's child thine? If such a one by education thou makest, thou gainest thanks of God, whose children we all be. Oxford's favourite book then, telling him that if he takes another person's son, he will gain the thanks of God. Also to bear in mind is another book which we know belonged to the Earl of Oxford, and that is his copy of the Geneva Bible, which survives in the Folger Library in Washington, D.C. Here you see a scan of Luke 9, 47 to 48, and you'll see that Oxford himself has underlined verses 47 and 48. When Jesus saw the thoughts of their hearts, he took a little child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever receiveth this little child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. In other words, God. So more evidence here from Edward de Vere's Geneva Bible that he is interested in this idea of taking on another man's child and believing that in so doing he will be received, thanked if you like, by God and by Christ. Another interesting figure who I continually bring into this story is John Dee and what is interesting about him in relation to Vere's surrogation of a son and having God's agreement to it is that Dee himself in 1588 
had been told by his scryer that a message had come directly from the angels, from God, to say that he, D, must go to bed with the wife of Kelly, and Kelly must go to bed with the wife of D. D was very nervous about this, but he did succumb to it, and nine months later, D's wife gave birth to a son, and that son, of course, is justified by D as a gift from God, which is why he was called Theodorus. Now, let us go to this extraordinary encryption of the dedication to Shakespeare's sonnets, published in 1609 and done by John Dee. Now, I am aware that I have led a large number of you through this magical portal several times, but let us go back there, because there is always more to be found, and let's look at it again in light purely of the use of numbers and the connection to truth, and of course to Veer and his surrogation of his son. You'll remember how we get there. We lay out the dedication into 19 columns. The columns that are of great interest to us are 3, 7, 9, 10, 14 and 17, all of which add up to 60. 60 is a number associated with time, with minutes, hours and seconds. It's no coincidence that in Shakespeare's sonnet 60, he meditates on minutes and on time. Time, of course, is the father of truth who lies hidden, buried in the centre of the earth. And that is why we find the message hidden, buried in the very centre of this grid, saying veritas, truth, veritas, venit in Jesum, in Jesus. If we go now to column three, I'd like you to notice that we seem to have, directly underneath it, the word three, divided only by a T. And as we know, three T's is what we call the triple tau, the key to the treasures, which we use to open this whole thing up in the first place. If you look at the first two letters, we see TH. Lowering a capital T onto a capital H gives you the triple tau. So you have that right at the beginning of line three, and right at the end of line three, TH again. The triple tau, everything comes in threes. Tria sunt omnia, omne trinum perfectum. Everything in threes is perfect. More perfect perhaps than we think when we look at the ground plan of Westminster Abbey as it sits there with the triple tau, 3T, right across the nave, and that fourth T, which we know is Edward de Vere, in the South Cross Isle, it's exactly where he's buried, the fourth T. Of course, it's flipped over this image, which is why we have IHS backwards. And the letters which form the Westminster, we can see there. I would have thought that this, on its own, was worthy of terrific applause, particularly since John Dee seems to just leave his name behind in within the cloister there. But as we all know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And what I'm wanting to look at now is this correlation between the column numbers and what lies beneath them. Remember that numbers to the minds of people like John Dee, Edward de Vere, Francis Bacon, numbers represent universal truths because God created the universe using numbers, which are thereby expressions of his divine will. Seven, for instance, represents Christ's forgiveness. We read in the Bible, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him, says Christ. Seven times in a day, notice, a day being a seventh part of a week. So seven, 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 the number of Christ's forgiveness. It can be no coincidence that if we draw the sign of Christ, the great Tau cross, right underneath the column seven, we find within it uh, a perfect anagram of eleison. Christe eleison means Christ have mercy. It cannot be a coincidence that Christ have mercy appears in the sign of Christ right underneath the number of Christ's forgiveness, nor can it be any coincidence that superimposed on that is the Petrine cross, the sign of the patron saint of forgiven sinners, which of course leads us to St. Peter's South Cross, where we know Edward de Vere is buried, but I don't want to dwell too much on his burial, so I'll move quickly past what lies in, in column nine, because we all know what that is. It's the, it's the capital I of Jesus, where we were told we would find the truth. The letters EDV, Edward de Vere, lies here. That's how we discovered that he was buried in the South Cross Isle. 
but I am more interested in what lay in column seven for the purposes of this presentation, when I discovered that he was buried in the South Cross Isle from these glyphs hidden here, it occurred to me that there must be the answer somewhere to the exact spot where he lies buried. But a similar question needs to be asked here. Why go to all the trouble to plead for Christ's forgiveness if you're not going to bother to tell us what it is, the sin that needs to be forgiven, the sin quite obviously relating to Edward de Vere, since we're told that it is Edward de Vere's burial that is being explained here. So it's to the right that we're going to find the answers to what that sin is. Remember, of course, the crucial thing that this whole puzzle is unlocked using the triple tau, and if there is to be a large triple tau glyph here, where should it be other than directly underneath the number nine, as it is, of course, a representation of nine, the three T's, the TTT, uh, the three triangles, of, as we saw on the dedication. There on the triple tau, you can see absolutely immediately on the central T, he lies. Is this the sin? You can see across the T's that form the wings, the word paternity creeping out there. Who lies about paternity? Well, as we all know, Edward de Vere is the fourth T. So you draw that fourth T in, which says de Vere in it and sits directly above the word fourth. So we know we're on the right lines and we read the message heed Vere's paternity lie. The importance of this, of course, is it tells us that the sin that Veer committed was not taking another man's son as his own, but it was lying about it. Sticking then with numbers that are so crucial to understanding all this, we look at column 14. 14 is the number that represents the male line of Christ in the book of Matthew, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Christ's line mapped out by 14 generations three times, just as we had uh, the forgiveness of sins three times mapped out by the number seven. So why then do we have a symbol of male generative power written within it Veer's line. In what way can Veer's line be compared to the line of Christ? Remember that Veer's line is an ancient line that comes all the way down to the 17th Earl of Oxford, and then the 18th Earl of Oxford isn't his, it's not his actual son. Well, let us go back to that passage from the book of Matthew and look at the verse numbers 17, 18, talking about Christ's line, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. We know very well that Vere knew all about this particular passage. He discusses it with a friend who became an enemy called Howard. But what is obviously interesting here is that this would have given Vere the sense that what he did insofar as having a child who is not directly of his line was in some way condoned or agreed by God. I'm sure it was Dee who would have pointed these verses out to him and these verse numbers are so typical of, of Dee's way of thinking. It doesn't, of course, leave the problem of the lie unresolved. If we go finally then to column 17, and we know that Vere is 1740, so we can make an upside down T by crossing column 17 with row 4. There we get a 1740, if ever there was one, and that represents Oxford, Edward de Vere, 1740. And inside it then we discover what that lie which needs forgiveness is, as we see the word sine prole m, usually SPM, standing for sine prole mascula. He is without male issue, so he has lied. Now quite clearly this whole business about forgiveness, about the lie, is what really matters to Veer. Are these sonnets in some way an atonement for that lie? I believe they are. In fact, if you look at, at Sonnet 17 itself, you get the line, the age to come would say, this poet lies. Well, we are the age to come, and that is indeed 
what we are saying. Let's just put that back as it was in the wonderful three triangles as it was designed and go, shall we, to Sonnet 17 because it's an extraordinarily interesting sonnet that tells us a great deal, starting with the number 17. Obviously it's 17th sonnet and the double V. Remember that V in Latin gematria is worth 20, so two Vs are 40, so we have 1740, identifying straight away, of course, Edward de Vere, who is this poet who lies. Who will believe my verse in time to come if it were filled with your most high deserts? Remember how we just looked at sonnet 33, where he uses a pun on the word sun to talk about both the celestial body and a child for four lines carrying on that double meaning is exactly what he's doing here. Every time Shakespeare in the sonnets talks about lines, his lines or his verse, be very wary because they have double meanings. His lines, of course, his literary lines, but also the lines of descent, his veers. And you see that in my verse, which is clearly a perfect anagram of my veers. Don't dismiss anagrams. Remember, that anagrams are connected to gematria, that the verse and veers have exactly the same value to them, and therefore, in the mind at least of veer, of John Dee, of Bacon, of all these people, uh, there is a divine correspondence between verse and veers. Who will believe my veers then in time to come, my, my line of descent, if it were filled with your most high deserts? Though yet heaven knows it is but as a tomb which hides your life and shows not half your parts. He's talking about hiding Rosalie, the man he's addressing, hides your life. Actually, if you look at this line, which hides your life, shows not half your parts, you notice that it actually contains the name Rosalie, not once, in fact, but twice. Coincidence? Well, look at this line. So, i.e. in this way, so should my papers, yellowed with their age, contains the name Rosalie, not once, but twice. To understand this we must go to the final couplet. But were some child of yours alive that time, you should live twice in it, comma, and in my rhyme. I stress that comma because most people don't even notice it, and they interpret it as you should live twice, comma, in it and in my rhyme, i.e. you just live twice, but no, twice in it, and therefore twice in my rhyme also, i.e. four times, the four hidden Rosalies we've already seen in the lines above. How does that work? Don't forget he is addressing the fair youth, the Earl of Southampton, Henry Rosalie. This is the last of the so-called procreation sonnets, and he's already said that if you have a baby for love of me, you will live in it. In other words, you will effectively live twice, and you will live, obviously, twice in my rhyme, once by virtue of the fact that you are memorialised in my immortal verse, and don't forget that the my rhyme of the final line is alluding to my verse, my veers of the first line, so you'll live once in my literary lines and once in my lines of descent in my veers. So you can see that these four hidden Rosalies are not just coincidence. If we go back to this extraordinary encryption by John Dee, we see that Dee has written his name there on the diagonal, not just to show off. He's doing it, I think, for a very good reason. He's trying to draw your attention to the diagonals, trying to make you look for other information on the diagonals. What he has done is to tie all these three remarkable glyphs together under the heading of the only begetter to let us know who the only begetter of the ensuing sun is and he's done it on the diagonals so if you look very carefully looking at diagonals only you see h e n r i e that gives you henry keeping to the diagonals w r keeping to the diagonals i o t h just above it E S L E Y, the only begetter, Henry Rosalie Ipse, meaning himself. Henry Rosalie himself, the only begetter of the ensuing son. One simply cannot help but marvel at this work that has been done here. Every time I show you one bit, I'm showing you, as you now know, the tip of an iceberg. We remember that the Westminster Abbey is sitting over in the left hand corner and forgiveness of sins in another and where he's buried. Absolutely extraordinary when you think that all of that is made just to fit inside these 
three triangles. Now, there's one question I think I have left unanswered. Why should Edward de Vere have gone down this peculiar route to surrogate an heir when he could have continued trying to get an heir in the normal way? Well, his wife Anne died in 1588, having borne him one son who died after two days and four daughters. He then remarried in 1591 Elizabeth Trentham. Could she not have children? Well, we don't know. My own speculation on this, looking at all the evidence of Edward de Vere and his clear connections to Templary, that he had taken a vow of chastity, as all those Templar knights did. If you look at Edward de Vere's Bible and look at the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, you see that he has once more underscored two verses. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, whom ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought for a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, for they are God's. This not only points very much to this whole idea of the sonnets being by God and Vere, this connection of God in Vere, but it is also verses that are used by the Knights Templars in their vow of chastity. In fact, the very next verse, which admittedly Vere does not underscore, says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. This dedication page is full of evidence of Edward de Vere's connection to Templary. We see the three triangles, triangle, 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 representing the three T's of the triple tau, that sign very much used by the Templar Knights and also by the Royal Arch Freemasons, that the 17th T is marked as 40, 1740, being a way that Edward de Vere connects himself to the Trinity. Note those three little T's above. And that, of course, is the upside down T, which forms uh, the completion, the quaternary within the ternary of the triple tau. Equally, we can look at these three triangles as the via veritas and vita that are formed into Edward de Vere's double V monogram, with the 1740 uh, being the upside down V that once again completes the quaternary hidden within the ternary. All this very connected to the Templars and the Royal Arch Freemasons. If we look again at the line lengths of these triangles. We see they are 6 to 4, and Oxfordians frequently point out that is the same letter lengths as Edward de Vere, or if you count up from the bottom, the line lengths are 4 to 6, the same obviously as Earl of Oxford. So time and time again we see Edward de Vere doing what the Templars are doing. He is connecting himself to the Trinity. He is giving money to the poor. If you look at his Bible, you see he's underscored many, many verses about giving alms to the poor, which is what the Templars did. And of course, the Templars undertook a vow of chastity. I am, of course, speculating, but that is what I believe happened. Perhaps he took his vow of chastity aged 40 on the 17th of April, 1590. Work that one out. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it hasn't been too complicated or too esoteric. It would be wonderful if you shared, subscribed and press that bell button to get this whole message going. Thank you very much indeed for watching.